I just basically give you a code for you to unwrap her books with the symbol that her characters are talking about inside the series. It's fascinating. But I was going with the eyeballs, and someone said to me, I was at Harvard Professor's room, it's probably Arabella or one of the Harvard Law Office there, said something like, you know, how about all those eyeballs? And all of a sudden I did the, oh my goodness. Now, there are five major eyeball moments inside the series. I give you one with the triangle, oh, that's kind of a hard one. Any other eyeballs in the series that come with it? Eye in the mirror. Eye in the mirror is, is the thing would get first, and at, the, at one of the giant scenes when, when uh, uh, in the Malfoy Manor basement or whatever. Yeah, so it, 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 the double door eye in, in the mirror is a giant one. Lily's eyes. Lily's eyes. Really, funny in the pan, right? I mean, there's only a few things that are said in every book. Harry Scar hurt worse than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd written the comedy. 
first response is, oh, I haven't gotten to that. It's like everybody's bucket list, right? You have to read the Divine Comedy at least once. Uh, and then they do the, come on, John, this is a kid's book about magic and wands, and you know, it's got a little boy walk hard, and, and you can tell the Uranus jokes in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is not a Dante thing. Um, but yeah, that's what this is about. And then to get that, the Dante connection, why? James Thomas says the real Debbie Hallows of Harry Potter and Canon is that the books are too current, they're too popular, and they're too juvenile, so people won't take them seriously as literature. Right? If the book's popular, current, juvenile, can't be really good. Right? It has to be James Joyce and Penetrable for it to be good. <laughs> can't have a plot. You know? uh, now, Rowling has put that to a lie, and the reason that the Dominic connection is not ridiculous is because of the evident fascination that Joanne Rowling has with the city of Florence, specifically medieval and renaissance Florence. We have a character named Firenze. Hey, Firenze is the Italian word for Florence. We've got um, alchemy everywhere. And if you go to the history of alchemy and the occult, the real pivot point in the West for that is in renaissance Florence. We've got memory magic, which is, if you've read uh, Giordano Bruno, and the Hermetic Tradition by Francis Chase, you know that memory, is, Francis Chase also called the art of memory, just to expand on this, that magic in Florence was largely about memory. And if you look, get the memory connection with uh, Joey and Rowling's things, just think of Tom Riddle in Chamber of Secrets, that basically becomes a memory card. Um, memory and, and the play of time and thinking is a large part of the card. We have hypocrites, which come out of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. We've got the four houses, which are Roman coming to the four cities in Northern Italy at the time. We've got Gryffindor and Slytherin, the warring factions, which, parent, which, which are very much like the warring houses of Florence. And the real, the real killer connection for me is that the snake chapter, what is it, Tale of Prince? Prince, Prince of Sam. Uh, there, there are five tales. If you read my book, Harry Potter's Bookshelf, that's also a good <laughs> That book has a large thing in there about all the tales. But the princess tale is which chapter that they have to What number is it? Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 30, it's chapter 33. And three is the defining number of everything to do with Dante's The Bible. We've got 100 cantos in all, but each of the three major books is 33. <laughs> she gives the, she's the 33 number on the princess tale. She's saying, Beat Dante, dummies! <laughs> no. You know what Dante, of course, it's all that whoosh! <laughs> Me, uh, uh, the reason that he uses green eyes was not in obscure detail. And, sorry, I'm just here. Uh, I think you've read the Dante book. It's a bestseller a couple of years ago, or whatever. I mean, the pivotal point of the book is largely the color of the interest of God. I mean, the reason this is not a small point is because the critical scene in the Divine Comedy is when we get to the end of the Purgatory. Right? At the end of the Purgatory, we find out, does Dante get to go into the Paradise? Has he made it? Has he been purified sufficiently to enter into Paradise and have the beatific vision? We kind of hope there is, because people get down or get that part of Whoops! You don't make it out, you know. You miss these two. But that scene, Dante is still very much in doubt. He is dragged through the river Lethe. So all of his memories and impurities and imperfections, especially his, all the things in the past that are still with him are taken from us, they say it back to him. But specifically about his memories being done. And then he's brought up to Beatrice, who has come onto the scene in a chariot drawn by a golden griffin. Now, a golden griffin should make, it, should make it, your eyes go up because in French, the, the words for golden griffin are griffin door. Uh, okay. This griffin has red wings, too, in case you want to get this right. Okay. Griffin door colors, griffin door. Um, she's read this book. All right. Now, when she, Beatrice gets off, this, the golden griffin is important not only because of the alchemical references of the, of the gold, 
Gold is solid light. Right? So basically you have an incarnate light here. Beatrice gets off and we get to be that she has green eyes. And uh, why a griffin? Griffin is half lion, half eagle. The symbolism is of Christ in that the eagle is the king of the heavens and the lion is the king of the earth. And so you have a symbol in this, this animal, this mythical animal of the god man. King of heaven, king of earth, there we have this, this uh, androgen figure, right? Uh, and it's gold, solid light, just like Christ is on the light of the world. Right? So it's something especially opaque here. She has this Christian, this, this Christ symbol, you draw the chariot in, and Beatrice, with her green eyes, looks at the griffin, and Dante looks into her green eye. And he said, or the poem goes, Dante's writing about himself. A thousand desires hotter than any flame bound my eyes to those shining eyes which still remain fixed on the griffin. She's looking at the griffin. She's, he's looking at the griffin through her eyes and the reflection of her eyes. Even as the sun in a mirror, not otherwise the twofold beast shone forth in them. Now with the one, now with other nature. He sees the eagle. He sees the lion. He sees both these things. Conceive, consider, reader, whether I was struck by wonder when I saw the thing itself remain as one, but in its image ever changing, while my soul, filled with wonder and with joy, tasted the food that satisfied in itself, yet for itself creates a greater craving. This is called Dante's uh, sacramental vision, because out by he's looking, he literally tastes the Eucharist. He's seeing the God being a thing. And when he sees this thing through in the eyes of his beloved in reflection, he then enters into paradise. And every time he needs to go to a different sphere of paradise, he looks into her eyes again, and he goes to a higher level within paradise. The green eyes thing is a big piece of one of the two or three greatest works in Western literature. Uh, so when she has stayed, what does that have to do with snake and shooting kids? Okay. First we have snakes three, let me find Harry Potter. Right, right, right. It's basically the inversion of the St. Peter scene with the Christ, where Christ says, feed my sheep, and that's all the Do you love Harry Potter? Back and forth, back and forth, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Here it's saying, let me find Harry Potter. Harry Potter being a stand in the ways of Christ figure. And, and this satanic figure, you can realize that the bad guy, he's got the huge snake around. Uh, <laughs> that's, you know, in, in, in English literature, which is largely a Christian game, the guy with the large snake. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Snake saying, let me find Harry Potter. No, in another way, forget about it. And then after the three third time, he loses the uh, he loses the guinea on Snake. And I assume you've already lost because of the spoiler sequence. <laughs> it's been three years. Um, I still people do that. I, we put out a book in the run-up called Who Killed Alex Dunbar? People do that. You ruined it for me! Snake does Snake then has his little very short dance with the gimme. And then Snape's Snape, is, Snape starts to expire. Uh, ex exit Voldemort stays left. And Harry comes through the wall, and we think this is where Harry kicks him, right? Harry's in the sand. We're glad I run into that guy. <laughs> Instead, he comes out of the wall and does the, wow, so you're the dog. So he's got a dog in motion, right? They didn't know what to do here. And Snape's doing, uh, uh, uh. Hermione thinks, and she moves up the crystal goblet, and what does Snape do? Dumps his memory. He cleanses himself of every memory that he had. Again, just like the Dante being dragged through the or whatever. And then he looks at Harry and gives him that great blood. And he smiles. Now, state fans, at talks I've given around the country, universities, you know, groups like this, uniformly, the state fans do the He's still alive, or what a lousy scene, or no, 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 no. And, well, do you remember when you know Steve Bandar put his number in the first convention? He's still alive. 